Welcome to the We the Patriots podcast. I'm your host, Sal Asante. And with me today, again, I will say, is Dr. John Marshall. John, how are you doing today? Oh, very good. Thanks. I'm glad to see that you are. I think that you picked out an outfit that was exactly the same as last time or damn close. I did. I, I did that. You know, you know, this is TV business. We're supposed to be able to like merge one thing into the other. You know, you don't oh, even yeah. tell everybody we're... <laughs> we're re- editing this thing but <laughs> no it's okay no 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 i had to, I had to right. but yes i use the same background the same shirt so that you could just kind of seamlessly yeah know, that's uh that's together. all on me i i take full blame <laughs> uh i will cut it together so what what does eventually when we do get get up on youtube i will put up the uh the whole podcast in one and i'll leave it as i'll leave it as like a, a one continuous and i'll cut it together so they don't see me blabbering all about me messing up but I thought it was very funny. I forgot to hit the record button on one of our most important conversations. It was very fun. Um, but we ended up really bleeding it into, I thought, a great conversation. Um, the only thing I was really missing was kind of why exactly you had the background that you did. And that's kind of what I wanted to revisit today and and kind of cover if you're good with that, John. Um, mm-hmm. So I would love to start it off by just kind of getting into it, really your educational background, why you decided to go for such a prestigious school. I know last, you know, everybody saw part one there. You saw that you went to Harvard, played baseball there even. So you were really uh, highly academically gifted. Um, but what made you go to Harvard in the first place? What, what made you even strive for that? Well, I mean, I don't, honestly, I, I don't know that I was like, quote unquote, striving for that uh in high school like i you know in high school i was just doing um uh, like i i know it's funny because now having worked in education for 20 years there's so much of an emphasis on college mm-hmm. prep you get you go to a lot of especially some of the charter schools and things like that where I mean, every homeroom is named after a college and they've got college sure. tenants and banners everywhere um you know we really didn't have much of that going on i mean there was like kind of in the background, like, you know, people go off to college, but uh, aside from maybe a bulletin board down by the guidance office, there wasn't like that daily emphasis. It was your daily emphasis was to do your chemistry homework, to do your, um, you know, get through calc to, you know, write your history paper. And um, so I don't think I was ever like particularly aiming for one school or another, Um in fact, aside from going to some academic competitions and playing some sporting events on different college campuses, like we played at Yogi Berra Stadium on Montclair campus, and we played mm-hmm. uh, and we did academic decathlon on the Drew campus, and I did a summer program at Monmouth, um, you know, local schools here. I really didn't have a whole lot of like college exposure. Um, and uh, in that's fact, I had never done even visited a college campus till my junior year. And then that summer, my dad had a, um, a and I had always followed Notre Dame football. I love Notre Dame. Uh, he had a business trip to Chicago. So I kind of tagged along. It was over the summer. And uh, and then we took a day and drove down to South Bend and checked out the campus. But that was and of course, it was the first one I had really seen um, other than some lo- local thing uh, you know, campuses. And so uh, it was like, wow, this is the greatest. And I was all about Notre Dame for a while. Right. Um, but when senior year came, I didn't really have a, a plan. I applied to 10 schools, mostly based on ones that I kind of liked from what I had either heard about or seen on TV. And some of it was sports related and didn't really have a great plan, but I applied to a couple Ivies, a couple, um, you know, really, you know, good independent schools, uh, Notre Dame, Duke. Uh, I applied to some public schools, UVA, um, and all the way across the board. I think I applied to some, some big schools, some small schools. Like I applied to William and Mary and Franklin and Marshall, some, some pretty small schools, uh, yeah, definitely because I really hadn't had a chance to explore a lot. And quite honestly, it, you know, did not have a great sense of where I would get in. Um, okay. You know, I, I, it's like when you're in a tiny high school with, I mean, my graduating class was something like 80, 
I don't know, seven or something like that. It was, it was really small. Right. Um, you know, you, you just don't know how a big school is going to interpret that. Um, you know, it's like, okay, what, what does your class rank really mean? What is, you know, what is this, what do your grades really mean? So, uh, so I kind of applied to like 10 schools, which I, which at the time was a lot. And actually there's a right. new story going around. It's like some kid who's gotten accepted to like 170 or 190 schools or something oh crazy like that, which is, I mean, <laughs> Obviously, the, the kid's very accomplished, good for him. But um, on the other hand, I think it's also a little excessive because, you, you know, you can say, oh, I, I got 300 million in scholarships. Well, yeah, but you can't use them all. You can only use one. So, mm -hmm. OK. Right. Yeah. But in right. any case, um, so I applied to 10 uh, and just kind of figured I'd see what happened. And actually, the funny story with it is that I had um, at that time, everything was by mail. It wasn't like there was no email or check online to see if you got in. And typically you got the acceptances around April the 1st and uh, April the 1st came around and, and I was busy playing baseball and all, and I had gotten um, nine out of the 10 responses on okay. April 1st or 2nd. And I had not heard from Harvard, um, but I had gotten into Notre Dame. I had gotten into Duke. I, you know, had a couple of good scholarship offers to consider. So um, I was really kind of deciding there and had almost written off Harvard. And then it was, it was late, like April, the, I don't know, eighth or ninth or something like that, that the Harvard letter came and it's like, Oh shoot, this complicates things a little bit. And for uh, sure. I can imagine. So, so what at was that the point, thought process there? Were you, were you pretty much on the way to Notre Dame at that point? And then it was really hard. I think so. I mean, Notre Dame offered me, uh, of all the other schools, Notre Dame offered me the most money and okay. it was a school I had loved. And so I, we actually had made plans to go back out there, um, go and, visit and again, one, one final check on that. Yep. And so actually, and I really hadn't done a lot of school visiting, um, cause when you're in basketball and baseball, you just don't have time to like go yeah, away for hard. three days. So, um, there were a couple of times where we picked like, I don't know, I think, once all the accept acceptances came back, that April became kind of just a blur because I think we'd have like baseball game or practice on Saturday morning. And then, right. you know, it's like immediately like quick, take a shower, leave right from the school, go off to Boston or go up, you know, go down to Virginia or whatever. So I think we did a couple visits like in that month there. Right. And um, it, I, I will say, I mean, I, I, when you, when you have your mind made up in any direction and then something new comes along, it's, it's, it's like a tough mental barrier to then, cause I had pretty much in my mind, I think decided I was going to Notre Dame and, yeah. um, and then this Harvard thing came along and it's like, Oh, well shoot. And, and Harvard, um, were, were you know, as certainly at that, uh, certainly now. And at, even at that time was very, very generous on financial aid. Um, now, yeah. Like today, if my parents were, if we were applying based on my parents' income, I would have gone for free, completely free. Um, even at that time, they uh, were, were the most generous in terms of financial aid. Um, really? And so it was, when it really came down to is I, I and, I, and I love Notre Dame. I, I really like Duke and I have a lot of, liked a lot of the other options, um, but it's hard to say no to Harvard and, um, and when they gave you the most money. And so I really did. And I went down to the last day with, with the three response cards in front of me. Yeah. And I think my, I was driving everybody crazy. And, uh, the last night, like, cause he had to respond by May 1st or whatever. Um, like the last night I'm sitting in the basement with like all three cards. And my dad was like, I'm going to bed. But and his comment to me as he went to bed was it's like, look, like, <laughs> You can go to one for undergrad. You can go to one of the other ones for grad school. Like just whatever. And as it turned out, that's exactly what happened. As I went right. to Harvard undergrad and I went to Notre Dame for grad school. So, wow, wow, that's really crazy. So, what you're sitting there, you're pondering that. What at the end of the day, what was it that that pushed it over the edge? Was it the fact that you're basically getting a free education at the most prestigious school, pretty much in in the United States? It was probably the wrong. Re like, I mean, it was probably the money. Yeah, I mean, that was okay. like I. I as I just couldn't justify in my mind paying more to go to Notre Dame than to, be, to go to, to Harvard. To be honest, um, I don't think it's a bad reason at all. Um, yeah. To 
when you get offered, like you said, it's it's Harvard. When you get offered that and with the money, and I was under the mis, uh, misinterpretation that Harvard couldn't give out scholarship money. So they that's... don't. They don't give out scholarships. Uh, like so, Notre Dame, and actually, and that's another thing is that is the terminology like Notre oh, Dame okay. and and Duke will give like like oh you've won the you know Soren Society scholarship or something like that, and you know. Hmm. You think, oh, I got, I want a scholarship, but when you look at the end of the day, and the financial aid comes in, and well, like a lot of times, what they do is they just reduce the financial aid because they say, well, you're getting ten thousand dollars from the Soren scholarship or whatever. So uh, instead okay. of giving you thirty thousand dollars in financial aid, we're going to give you twenty thousand, but now you're getting ten from over here, so it comes out the same. Harvard doesn't give academic scholarships. They don't give athletic scholarships. They don't give any. Right. So anybody who says well, I'm I'm going to Harvard on full scholarship, so I wasn't wrong. Not true. I just misinterpreted. Okay. No, it. They do what they do do though is, is they give very generous financial aid, and and then people can win outside scholarships. Like you know, I, I also had a national merit scholarship, and you had a couple other things playing in there. But um, when you're talking about the Harvard's actual packages, they're, they're it's it's all done through financial aid. So, wow. okay. but the the financial aid part, thank you know, thankfully, because of you know the their willingness to give it out, and also because oh, you know we qualified income wise, um, it still made it the best offer out of the out of all the ten choices. Yeah, definitely. So now I know we talked a little bit about your time in Harvard, but I'm more curious about your transition from Harvard and how you kind of went, didn't you go directly into teaching from there? Pretty um, much. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, how, it wasn't, how did that it, work out? It wasn't really planned. Um, I had, I actually thought I was going to do, I mean, coming out of Harvard, there's, uh, there's a couple of very popular tracks. I mean, you can go to law school, you can go to med school. Uh, there's, you know, people who go work at other universities, go straight into grad school. Mm-hmm. And, uh, my apologies. Uh, and uh, there's um, a lot of folks who go into consulting. And so I kind of thought I was going to go consulting because after all, at 21 years old with a Harvard degree, you, you have you must know more than all the you know great Fortune 500 companies. And so therefore, you know, you, you, you should just something. go share your wisdom with the, <laughs> with the world. Um, right. You know, with, with the cloak of McKinsey around you or something. But uh, in any case, I, I kind of thought that's what I was going to do and um, had had interviewed with a bunch of consulting firms and all. Um, it was a, uh, you know, 2001 was when I graduated. That was kind of in the midst of the recession. Uh, and then, of course, uh, and I eventually did have a job sort of lined up. And then um, it was going to start in the fall. And then 9-11 happened. And and then all, all that kind of fell apart even more because there was just so much uncertainty in the right. So, um, so I ended up coming back, uh, to New Jersey and, um, you know, quite honestly, as I was looking for other options, I, I was put on hold, like uh, they kind of deferred my start date at first for the, the job I was going to start. And I said, well, I'm just sitting around here right. waiting for the start date to happen. I might as well do something. And so then I started working in the school and coaching and, okay. um, and I ended up really liking it. And so then, and then an opening hmm came up came up and uh so you started as a coach before a teacher uh before i was a full-time teacher yeah, yeah. Wow. so i was i was kind of like doing a long-term okay. sub situation and then um and i started coaching and then when the vacancy happened um at the end of the school year and and it became clear that the consulting thing wasn't really happening um the school pretty much came to me and we're like well do you want to do this full time and i i said yes and so then I went through uh, the wow. alternate route program to become certified. Awesome. So how how was the process to get certified? And when did you make that decision to actually go to grad programs after that? Yeah, so uh, the, the certification process is pretty straightforward. The alternate route uh, program in New Jersey is, a, is actually a great program. Um, okay. It was designed really not for people like me. It wasn't intended for people right out of college necessarily. It was designed for people who are mid-career uh uh, kind of career changers, uh, particularly, um, you know, there's always shortages in math and science. Um, it's right. one of the hardest areas to fill. And in New Jersey, we happen to have a lot of pharmaceutical companies. We've got a lot of tech, high tech places uh, with people who are knowledgeable and certainly qualified to teach things like biology and chemistry, but who may not have had the certification. 
who then, you know, they work for a big pharma company for 25, 30 years. They retire and they say, hey, look, I'm 55 years old. I'm not old enough to go off into the sunset yet. I want to do something, maybe give back a little bit. And so this program was intended to allow them to come into the classroom, start teaching right away, and then earn their certification during their first year of teaching. So that's what it was designed that's for. That's a cool program. Yeah. Uh, and it and it was really good. Um, it was uh, relatively painless. Um, it was meeting. Uh, I did one. Uh, the program I did was through Ramapo, and it was a couple nights a week. Um, and I was very fortunate to have two uh, really, really, you know, helpful and and um, dedicated teachers in that program. Sure. And, um, they were, they were both very knowledgeable, uh, former superintendents and, um, you know, did that program and became official. And, um, I will say that the hardest part was the, the, uh, not the, not the teaching, you know, instruction. It was more of the, the paperwork and the I'm sure back office stuff because it was like the state of New Jersey plus the university, but you know, it had to like right. figure out who gets imagine. this check, who gets that check. And uh, that was, and then I had actually started with a program at William Patterson, but theirs was like a weekend based thing and mm. it wasn't going to work with coaching. Yeah. With baseball and basketball, <laughs> I can imagine that was a mess. Yeah. So I, uh, and so I had, I had started there and I had written a check to them. Um, and then I was like, this isn't, going to work schedule wise and i found out that ramapo had an, an evening schedule said okay that's going to work better but then like the switching from william patterson to ramapo i think i i still somebody still owes me about 500 bucks in this whole process but <laughs> i think william patterson never gave me back my my initial 500 bucks or whatever but oh well that's awesome oh my god you gotta go get them now john so <laughs> what was the time frame where you taught and then decided to go back to school get more get more education. So I taught for, uh, so from that point on, I taught for five more years. Um, and then I, you know, I don't, I really thought I was going to just stay for a couple of years and then hmm. I still, I still was thinking I would go back to law school. Um, and then as time went on, I just kind of felt less and less, like I, I loved the idea of the challenge of law school. I didn't necessarily, um, love the idea of being a lawyer. Um, I, I kind of cringed at the notion of billable hours and things like that. Um, <laughs> although it's kind of funny because as time has gone on and, you know, 20 years has passed, I've gotten to know some, some really wonderful lawyers who do great things. And I, sure. I think maybe if I had had those, um, uh, you know, connections back then, maybe I would have felt a little differently, but, um, I got you. I, but I had kind of, I really enjoyed what I was doing. I loved the, uh, you know, the coaching, I loved the teaching. And so I, I stayed, ended up much staying much longer than I thought I would um, right. you know, five more years. And then I, it was really, um, it was two things. One was the, uh, um, I had a class that I had kind of got, gotten very close with. And then I was like, well, you know, this might be a good breaking point because I can kind of like graduate with them. Um, and then the second piece of it right. was also like, I had always, I said, a bunch of people had told me like, don't wait too long if you're going to go back to school, because even if you're going to stay in teaching, it, it, we talked about the salary guides, um, you know, it, it makes sense to move laterally across the salary right. guides. So, so even if you want to come back to the classroom, go, go get your master's before, you know, you don't want to wait till be 45 because, you know, you might as well move up the guide now and get paid more for doing the same thing. So I said to myself, well, you know, I can, if I leave right now, I can go get my master's be done before I'm 30. That probably makes sense because if I stay here, you know, another five years or 10 years. And, you know, at some point you become kind of committed to this is my entire career trajectory. Not that that would have been a bad thing. I, I loved it when I was there and I probably would have enjoyed it a lot, but, um, you know, I think I wanted to have some additional yeah. options down the road. So that's kind of what, what pushed me out. And as I applied to schools, I, I looked at some op at some different programs and, um, by that point, I had set, kind of centered on business school. A couple of my college friends and roommates had, had done business school and had good experiences there, and um, and it was it seemed to be relatively flexible as far hmm. as a uh, a degree path. Like you could do, you could come back into education, you could go change careers, you could do a whole bunch of different things with it. And and then so I applied to a bunch of programs, and Notre Dame just kind of blew me away with an offer of you know essentially full tuition 
scholarship. And then I was able to also get a job working in an undergraduate dorm. So I got free room, room and board uh, to be an advisor. And um, so I, I actually ended up making money going to Notre That's Dame. They, they paid me a salary to, to go to school. So that's um, actually bizarre. Wow. It was hard to hard to say no to that. That's pretty cool though. But so you got the undergrad experience technically at both Harvard and Notre Dame, mm-hmm. both schools that you were really, really considering in the beginning. That's really cool. That's yep. That seems like it came full circle there. Yeah. And and I mean Harvard is many things, but it is not a sports school. So to oh. have the opportunity to Actually, you know, even though I was there during the Charlie Weiss era, which was probably like it was like the worst two years in the history of Notre Dame football um, statistically, I think. But um, yeah. but still, to get to be able to go to every game, to be there on campus, to see game day, uh, was was a lot of fun. And and also, you know, all the other sports. I mean, basketball and ice hockey and baseball. It was it was a lot of fun to um, to kind of be part of that as well. Yeah, definitely. I could only imagine. Well, I. I think that that leads us pretty well into our conversation with Andrew, where we picked up, where we left off. I don't know which one it will actually be, but for everybody else, it'll be just zooming in there. Um, One thing I did want to add, and I I think I'll add on to the end of our conversation there as a little extra tidbit, um, was I want your opinion on how is, um, have you been looking into AI at all? You know, only from what I've seen, and uh, I, I really have not researched it nearly okay. as much as I probably should have. I've, I've seen some of the stuff with like ChatGPT and other AI stuff on yeah. like the news Are you and whatever. To be professing. I'm sorry. Are you going to continue to be professing and teaching going forward? Um, probably. Um, okay. I mean, the thing, the uh, that's I don't know like super long range, how, how long right, I'm going to keep on doing this. Um, the class, like, but I think that the problem is not necessarily in the things that I teach. Like, I mean, I, I'm in graduate school uh, instruction right now. So the, the students I have are doctoral students and the, the assignments are all, you know, they're not necessarily AI kind of things. Like uh, in my it's, class, it's, it's not a, like it's a straight up English class. Yeah. Oh no no it's it's an it's a problem solving class essentially so what I tell them to do is to take a problem that they have in their workplace and then we work we apply a bunch of different tools to their problem so we take their problem right. we kind of define their problem statement we go through a process of uh, root cause analysis and identifying key drivers and then figuring out mm-hmm. you know what actions to take based on those drivers it's not really the kind of thing AI is going to help with I mean if it if it mm. could, they would have done it already. I was going to say, so, I'd be interested to see if one of them brings it up as a solution to a problem in the future. It, that's uh, probably more likely where I would encounter it. Um, if okay. they are having issues with, um, you know, I have uh, a, a number of uh, military folks in my classes. and Oh, really? Okay. Uh, and I, I don't know what their ability to use AI kind of technology is, mm. but, but a lot of the... Um, the kinds of things that they have had problems with, which are absolutely real and bureaucratic kind of issues. Um, for example, uh, things like, uh, you know, there's in the entry levels of the military, you have a lot of turnover. Um, you have folks coming in, you know, new new recruits out of basic training who then are right. given jobs but they don't have the institutional knowledge and the people who had those jobs may no longer be at that location. The and ones so who not have like, the knowledge they need. Right. So you kind of have, you know, it's nobody there to train these folks about the new job that they're coming into. And, mm. and so it's like, that was one of the problems that one of my students was, was trying to deal with. Like, how do we not lose our institutional memory every time we get a new batch of people in here and, and there's a whole bunch of promotions and the promotions take people from this base and, I forget where he was, Tennessee yeah. or Kentucky or something like that. And then, you know, they go to yeah. those, the previous people go to Texas and we get new, new people in, but nobody knows what to do anymore. And there's like this long lag time, um, like something like AI could really help with. I was going to say that, that sounds like a an like AI that. problem. Um, um, but in terms of like, actually like get doing the work now, I think oh, that no. when you're talking about something like, uh, you know, high school algebra, well, what um, I was going to actually ask more importantly would be, I take it back to your, you go back to your AP Gov class that you taught mm-hmm. in Kinelon. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, 
in that class, are you more so worried about it? Because you could have the most stellar student who's putting on a show, but when it comes to the AP test, they get a two. And, you know, as a teacher, it's going to break your heart because the whole time to you, it's looking like effort's been putting in, but in reality, it's been a computer that's been functioning as a brain the whole time. Um, that's where I more so see it taking effect. Um, you know, I, th- I think you, I, a lot of it, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that it's incumbent upon the teachers to uh, find ways to assess students that are not going to allow for AI or any for or sure. any other types of interventions. Um, there are programs like Turnitin and things like that that will will check for plagiarism. Um, on papers, I but I think it's beating it at this point. I'm pretty sure that I, that but yeah, the, uh, I, Chat GPT is beating the uh, turn it in papers. But there's a real simple solution to that, and that mm-hmm. is, guess what, kids? We're going to write an essay, and you're going to be here in class, and I'm going to hand, hand you a piece it. of paper and a pen, yep. and it's going to be in your handwriting. And you don't have computers, you don't have this, yep. you don't have that. You here, you use your textbook if you want, but you know, if if you can't, couldn't agree more. Yep. I will say that takes time to grade. It takes it's uh, takes time in class to assess. It takes you know yep. reading student handwriting is you know the bane of every teacher's existence. But right. you know at the end of the day, and and I could see that when I had kids who turned in really really nice uh, typewritten papers for their take home assignments, and then when it comes to the time, uh, like every single test I gave there was usually a multiple choice portion or something where I'd get objective answers. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I had would have typically I'd have what they call identifications where I'd give them certain terms and they had to write me a passage about, you know, what is, what's the significance of this thing. Right. And then, and then there was an essay and the essay and the, the essay and the IDs were worth more than half of the test. So if you didn't, if you couldn't do anything on those, Mm -hmm. Okay. I passed my class. and Yeah, but that's a well-structured class. And don't you think, um, you know, especially with the way that teaching has uh, has headed in its direction the last couple of years with COVID becoming almost completely online in some cases, um, don't you think that in some cases educational system might have put itself in too big of a hole to uh, to breach for this, for this problem? Yeah, I, you know, I think... Uh, the COVID presented all sorts of challenges that we hadn't seen before. Oh, yeah. And I, um, I it's think that where we, <laughs> no, that's just, that's just one of many. And probably for the last couple of years, I mean, uh, I've had, had I been in, you know, in the classroom in, in the high school classroom, the last couple of years, you know, you probably just have to give in because if you don't see your kids in person, there's really no way you can, you know, exactly. assess for that's that. Although, point, though, yeah. that's although there point. are, now you got a real back. There's, there's ways of writing questions though, that, make the answer um I, I don't exactly know how some of the new ai stuff it, although the it's i feel like most of this ai stuff has kind of come out in the in the last you know year to two it's been about the last two years year and a half yeah something like and, that and so i think like during the worst of covid i don't know that all of that was out there or at least no no it wasn't it's more high school it's, kids it's more gonna affect basically now and going mm-hmm. forward yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, so I think you know it, it, some of it's just is the willingness to go back to paper and pencil, um, at, at least for okay. maybe not for every ass- assessment, but you've you know you only take one or two to be able to see if, if to actually have a barometer student, on the student. Students yeah. are really you know you know getting what you're what you're teaching, and then I think the other piece of it is is structuring questions in such a way that it's not something that could easily be answered by a yeah i think that's i think that's important because and oh you just mentioned it right there okay so as i've been using more of chat gpt and trying to play around with the ai and whatnot all i'm realizing is that it's just a glorified google it's just a one answer google and you tell it what the answer is it's actually kind of trying to work with you but Mm -hmm. it's heavily moderated it's getting its answers from google essentially and it's just one answer so Mm -hmm if you can do the same thing you were doing with Google, cause you know, kids were using Google the whole time you were teaching, mm-hmm. you just manipulate that question a little bit more vaguely or have that AI have to generate its own thoughts. And all of a sudden words are being made up out of whole cloth stuff's getting taken out of context. And I think it would be easy to tell. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think, again, that's why when you start, write a question or if you're, I, I actually wish this was part of teacher education a little bit more is, is how do you mm. um, structure assignments in such a way that it forces independent thought. Um, I've, I've had right. a few people who do this really, really well, um, but I still also see, you know, test questions like, you know, describe, uh, you know, describe the events of 1776 or, you know, or, or uh, you know, you what, yeah. what did George Washington do as president or things like that? Well, I mean, you're basically asking them to do a Google search and you're and asking to, them for a vague answer. Yeah. You're just, not really and just to spit back a bunch of, of information but that, that, I mean, realistically, nobody knows coming out of the womb, like what George Washington did as president. Like it's something you right. have to get from somewhere. And I mean, ideally you'd love for students to be able to read their textbook and remember it. But, you know, aside from doing that kind of a question on a, um, a pen and paper test where they don't have resources, like, you know, if you're putting them in front of a computer, like, what are they going to do? Of course they're going to use Google. It's just not, but it, there's also a way of structuring a question that makes it such that it's not just a Google answer. Maybe you can get information. You could find primary sources right. to back you up. You could do things like that from Google. And and if that's the case, well, then you're you're fine with, with students using Google to find those pieces of inf information. But it's writing it's writing a question that's going to force students mm. to um, to make an argument to use sources to defend that argument. And that's not something that a Google search is necessarily going to do for you. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I'm glad you said that because that was a lot of how I, I did a lot of my school research, especially because a lot of our sources ended up being available online. I just ended up Googling a lot of stuff um, and you just take bits and pieces out of it. But the biggest thing is, are you taking it from the Wikipedia page or are you taking it from whatever source document and actually trying to read in? Or are you getting analysis from someone who's noteworthy? that actually has something to say on the topic or are you just reading a Twitter post, right? So there's a lot of ambiguity online. So I, I really like what you said there, John. And um, we have educational issues that I think are stemming from a lot of, a lot of different pinpoints I think you're mentioning, John. And so is there a reasonable way that we can attack it? Like, is it a problem that has enough laid out that we have an ability to actually go checklist like we just mentioned and actually go at the problem or has it become so widespread and so ingrained in our system that we might need an actual new education system like you've been in it long enough to give more of a viable opinion i think than anybody on the internet yeah um i uh i think that there are a number of problems i think that it's not just one problem and of so I think that, in fact, <laughs> ironically, what I teach now uh, to my doctoral students is class essentially on problem solving. And, you know, no matter how idealistic you might be and how committed you might be, if you're trying to solve 25 things at once, you're probably not going to solve any of them. So you got you right. to say, OK, the first thing I need to solve is the whatever, um, the recruitment of new teachers into the profession or the. Um, you know, figuring out ways to uh, find people to teach difficult to staff subjects, um, mm. the languages, yeah. the sciences, um, ESL, special ed, um, mm. and figure out ways to better do that. And, you know, or if you're talking about a, a bigger system level thing, like how do you fix um, some of the, the challenges of large school districts where, you have, you know, I think some of the, the numbers coming out of places like, um, you know, Baltimore, I think, had a large number of schools that didn't have a single student pass their state tests. Uh, I saw that. And yeah. so that's mind baffling to me. So like, we, and depending on which of those problems you want to go tackle, um, I think your your approaches are going to be a little different. Correct. Um, and none of them are going to be quick because these are all long-standing entrenched problems and one of the problems in education is that we we tend to dive towards quick fix solutions because 
And, and it's, it's usually for a noble reason in that everybody says, well, we can't wait a second because these kindergartners aren't learning how to read. And if we don't teach them how to read, then they're, you know, um, their whole educational trajectory is going to be off. So we need to do something right now. So let's, let's come up with a quick fix solution. And it feels good in a sort of, you know, warm and fuzzy way that I'm doing something about the problem. But if it's not thought out, if it hasn't really identified the true root causes of the problem, and if it's just kind of superficially attacking whatever's going on, you're really not going to make distinct inroads in that problem. Um, you know, real so solutions. You think the problem is is too big. No, I think, but I think you have to decide which problem you're going to solve and then tackle that specifically, and gotcha. then and then move on to the next one. So if your if your right. issue is, um, you know, retaining teachers because you you know, oh, whatever, point. then you got to say, all right, well, why aren't teacher is staying in the profession and you can look right. at it well maybe it's other fields have more competitive salaries maybe the working conditions aren't the best so on and so forth and you see well what what are the driving factors what are the the primary drivers of what's going on that's causing people to leave the profession early instead of staying in for 30 year careers right and then you say okay well i maybe i can't fix the all of the salary stuff. I can't just make millions and millions of dollars appear, but what can I do with the money I do have to better incentivize the real top performers to stay? And then you can say, all right, well, right. maybe I can't raise everybody's salary across the board, but I can put in some performance pay or whatever. And you can do trials like that and, and see what works um, yeah. and, and what doesn't. And, and honestly, there's probably going to be some degree of getting things right and getting things wrong. And, you do see some innovative cities out there that are trying things. Um, but I think the larger and more complicated a an institution is, like doing things new in New York City public schools or LA Unified or uh, CPS, it's, it's just so hard because they're so big and it's so It's almost unreasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a, a lot of the most innovative stuff is coming out of like the charter world and the private world at this point, just because they've, you know, if, if you're a, a sole operator, a single charter school, you can be a lot more creative with how you use your money. You can create stipends, you can create leadership tiers where you can give some people a sense of career advancement. Um, you know, you start off as a teacher, then you move to like a teacher leader, maybe then a teacher mentor. And then, you know, maybe at some point you're, kind of like in, moving into administrative roles and and there's a lot more of a career ladder whereas in the traditional public school system you you pretty much are a teacher and then if you wanted to go get a degree in school administration you could you could try to be like a vice principal or a principal but that's like almost like a totally different right. it's not just even a hey you're a great teacher so let's just promote you you got to go get these extra certifications and, and right. the, the hoops to jump through like in new jersey um you know like I got, I did my doctorate at, at Vanderbilt, doctorate in educational, you know, leadership, and yet I, I just can't come back to New Jersey and be a principal at a public school. You have to go get certified specifically for New Jersey. Exactly, because there's wow. New there's New Jersey specific courses. Um, there's one on school budgeting that you have to take. There's another on like school safety, I think, and those are things that you have to do in New Jersey. So. If I wanted to go be a school principal in New Jersey, I'd have to go through like the NJXL program, right. which is like a year long and, and not cheap program where you go, you know, a couple times a week to classes and have a an existing principal or vice principal who's your mentor and go through like a year long process and then you can can get your certification. Um, now, if I had if that had been my goal all along, I could have gone to, to a New Jersey accredited school. Right, done my degree here and then that would have been baked into it but that wasn't necessarily my my attention right yeah that's uh, but that's just bizarre that they're that unwilling to work with outside but i mean that probably plays a, a small part as well in the uh you know the bucket that we have to pick from when we're talking about our new jersey teachers mm -hmm. um now one thing i did want to bring up that i was curious to find out when i did was that Generally speaking, when you go and teach in a private institution, you're actually going to get paid less. That's um, true. And by and large, that's um, to me, that's pretty shocking because you would think the opposite, especially as a parent from the outside looking in. You're paying all that tuition <laughs> essentially for what you can get 
the equivalent in the in, in the public schools. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, the, the tuition tends to go for the uh, the beautiful campus and the endowment and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, it is true. And, and, you know, Catholic schools pay probably, by and large, the least. Private schools, um, you know, maybe a touch more, um, but, but definitely less than the public system. Public sure. system. In fact, in unless you are, even if you're a junior professor at most universities you'd actually make more as a public school teacher um at the the top of the guide so if you have a doctorate and if you actually the hard thing is to get hired with a doctorate because you know if a school system sees that you have a doctorate then they know they're gonna have to wow you're expensive which is why you tend Mm -hmm. to see people with doctorates in hard to fill subjects like for example, chemistry or physics, but you don't necessarily see people with doctorates teaching English because English They're teachers expensive. are a lot easier to find and they don't want to, yeah. you know, put all that that salary towards uh, an English teacher. The better districts, they're going to hire the right people no matter what. But if you're if you're in a district that's cutting costs, then then like you know somebody with um, an MA 60 or a doctorate is going to have a hard time getting a job. Wow. Um, do you think that a private school teacher who does make a lot less, do you think that affects the quality of the education of the students who attend that private school at all? Or do you think it not, doesn't make much of a difference? Uh, I think it, it probably is case by case basis. I think it, those private schools, you do get a little more flexibility. Your course load isn't quite as heavy. Class sizes tend to be smaller. So um, I, I I think like if you're if you're a maybe like a younger less experienced teacher um thrown into the choice of a public school or a uh, a private school yes you might be making less money at a um at a private school but I think there's probably a little more in the way of guardrails for your success um in that at a private school, um, at public schools, too often discipline gets thrown back at classroom teachers and mm. they're told to deal with it. Um, at, a, yeah. at a private school, there's a little bit more of a, a stick. If you know if a student really is acting out, they can That's correct, be kicked right. out of the school, which doesn't really happen in public schools. So there's um, ways that it balances out. Yeah. And and certainly like the, just the, the number of students that you have and the, the number of courses that you're teaching. I mean, that I had a couple of years where I had six classes and in excess of 120 students. And, you know, that's, in fact, I think one year I was almost at 150 students. It was like 142 or something at the start of the year. Um, it's just really hard. I mean, <laughs> to, to deal with that, you know, and I, and I wasn't even a, a rookie teacher at that point, but if you want to give legitimate assignments, like if I, like I, I really emphasized writing in fact i I always said at the beginning of my classes like i'm going to try to teach you history i will teach you how to write um and the only way you're going to do that is by giving a lot of writing assignments and giving good feedback on those but to give feedback on 140 that takes time that's a seven or eight page papers that takes an enormous amount of time so if i had i had 70 students instead of 140 i could have given way more detailed feedback more timely probably done more you know, iterations and said, okay, I'll here, here, do this first, then I'll give you some feedback, then you do it a re- re- revision. When you're dealing with 140 kids, you just can't do that. So, um. yeah, I think that's pretty plain to see. Now, when you shifted over to, uh, to university education, was, uh, was that like a kind of a challenge that you put on yourself to go and, and do that? No, it actually kind of happened. Um, I was okay. uh, working for state of New Jersey and uh, I was doing my doctorate at the same time and uh, finished my doctorate. And that year um, I finished in 2018, that fall uh, Vanderbilt decided that they were going to launch an online doctoral program. Mm. And, um, you know, I had previous teaching experience. And so they, I guess I was, a good enough student that they were like, you know, Hey, you could probably teach something here. Uh, you have teaching experience before, and now you've got a doctorate. Would, would this be interesting to you? And I kind of had said, well, yeah, you know, it, it would. Um, 
it would be nice to to stay in doing something teaching related and so i i said all right you know i i'm i'm game and then um i kind of learned how to to teach online we we started on this um adobe connect type platform which was kind of clunky and then eventually we transitioned to zoom um which was much easier to work with but uh it was i had to kind of figure out how, how do i build my lesson plans my slide decks all that kind of stuff how do i get used to right. teaching to a computer completely um, remote completely remote but um you know so the, but they really came to me and asked me if i wanted to do it and i i okay. said yes and then the irony is that the reason that they were looking for you know a newly minted doctorate person to go teach these classes was because none of the senior faculty wanted to teach online yeah, they, yeah. they already had their their slideshows they had their um their lessons like i've been doing the same thing since 1974 you can't make me change and exactly. um you know then all of a sudden covid hit and then they had to change <laughs> so right. um it's uh but i, I kind of got in on the, the ground floor of this online teaching thing so yeah, definitely. So now you're still, if I'm not mistaken, you're still doing some stuff with the state of New Jersey as well. Um, or just kind of. Not if I can out. help it. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. So as, as you had to see, I guess you've been around New Jersey education for so long. Mm -hmm. Has it been, because I'm just too young to remember, has it been a steady decline or did it happen? In my mind, it happened around when my brother was younger. It seemed like. I was getting to about my freshman year, maybe my eighth grade year. And so this would be something like 2013, 14. And all of a sudden it seemed like the education system changed and it changed with a reason to try to teach me something I didn't want to learn. Well, um, okay. So I would say it, um, I don't know that there was, it, it's quite so much, a. There was a a one inflection point where things right, which is how I, I I doubt it could ever be true that that's the rails. The um, you know, it, it's also when you're talking about statewide. Um, you know, New Jersey has a very long and complicated history of. In fact, it's it's one of the more interesting cases of you know across the whole country, um, mm -hmm. because of our our system. Um, New Jersey, I think the last time I checked, had six hundred and one independent school districts oh, i think we were talking about this at some point yeah it's, yeah most it's states a... tend to do uh education on a county level um maybe if they have a big city the city schools might be one system but then the the counties kind of handle a lot of the other educational duties mm -hmm. new jersey all every little burg and borough has its own school district and as a result you get wild variations and it's always been the case that you know, that there's a handful of towns and a handful of counties that are some of the best education uh, opportunities in the whole country. I mean, I, if you look I at would New put, Jersey, yeah, 100 percent. I would put New Jersey's top, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 towns up against, you know, just about any other public school system in the whole country. And then there's also a handful of like the bottom. very you know yeah. challenging districts where um you know education has always been a difficult thing and yeah. you know you can go back to uh, the abbott v burke decision which was in the early 80s where they were talking about the differential uh treatment of these the so-called abbott districts the low-income districts and oh okay and then there was a, a number of other decisions therefore um that, that followed that um, the the whole concept in the New Jersey Constitution guarantees a quote thorough and efficient education to New Jersey students and so definitions of what thorough and efficient means are, are kind of subjective um, the state's usual answer is has been have we thrown enough money at it and <laughs> so a lot of it is it com comes down to funding. And that's not entirely, um, you know, a, a, it's not entirely off base because you don't want underfunded schools. Certainly a, a, a school that has a large percentage of non-native English speakers is going to have costs and needs that are different 
than a school where everybody comes to school reading and writing English. Right. But that said, I think it's it's made a lot of the larger districts into these kind of uh, slush fund districts where you see, you know, huge amounts of middle management people who really don't contribute a lot to the educational output of uh, of what really happens on a day to day basis, and uh, you know, there, and there's also when any, anytime you get a big system, the big companies have waste, big uh, government institutions have waste, big school districts have right. waste. Um, you know, if you're if you're like a you know little kinalon with one you know one K two and one three five and one middle mm-hmm. school and one high school it's a little easier to spot waste um, than it is in a school with, you know, 54 district with 54 schools. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that point you bring up is not just true to education. I think it's true. I think you even said it to a lot of big systems when it gets oh, that yeah. big. Yeah. And, and, you know, companies are like, you know, everybody, people who say, well, oh, the private market is so much more efficient. Well, you know, like it, I remember my dad, not necessarily. Uh, no, not at all. In fact, my dad used to go, um, he was a, a tax auditor and he would go to companies, okay. all different companies, um, you know, each week he'd be at someplace different. And he went to one large multinational company that was headquartered in New Jersey. Um, and he, I remember him just telling, retelling a conversation he had with the tax manager there. They're walking down the hallway and one one person walks by with tennis rackets and somebody else walks by with like, you know, like they're about ready to go for a run and somebody else walks by, you know, with like paintings under their arm. And he's like, does anybody work here? And and the tax manager just kind of shook his head and was like, we don't fire anybody. It's just It's just easier to carry them, you know, because we're just going to, you know, so they get to a point, they they reach a certain plateau, they put in their time, and then if they kind of check out, we just carry them. And and so, like, there's waste in, in companies, too. It's, it's easier for a big institution to say, you know what, we're just going to pay the salary than it is to to go through the hassle and, and stress and all that of, of trying to fire somebody. So, um, yeah, I think the, the where that would never happen in, like, a, a mom-and-pop deli, you know, if somebody was right. was sitting there going off and playing tennis every day, they would get fired. It would, you know, you can't carry somebody in a in a small mom and pop business. It just like you can't uh, couldn't. It would stand out much more in a in a small school or district. Yeah, exactly. I that that makes a lot of sense for me. Now, Andrew, do you have anything else on education? Because I want to give this guy a break. <laughs> yes, actually, I had one. Yeah. <laughs> Very important question, I think. I believe so. Tenure, I believe tenure is what five years. Uh, I believe it's public four. School teacher in New Jersey? It, it, was, it was three when I was there, and now it's I believe it's up to four. Um, it's it's four, but it it's uh, there's a revocable thing that there was not like it used to be three, and if you put in your three years in a day, you were set for life, and short of like beating up a kid, you were there was nothing in the world that was ever going to take it away. Um, and that's kind of my question is that like, we were talking about the pension system and how that can kind of keep some like dead weight retained. Do you think having that tenure bar be set so relatively low, do you think that can be harmful? Yeah. I, I think that's actually the bigger issue than, than the pension thing really. Um, yeah. And the pension is more of a, a reward. And, and, and I honestly look at it more as like a deferred salary um, because you're, you're saying it's kind of like if you win the lottery, do you take all the money up front and pay all the taxes up front? Or do you say, I'll take the annuity and get it paid out over time? If you really are committed to a te- teaching career and you say, look, yes, this year, I'm, I'm in year one, I'm going to make, I guess the starting salary in New Jersey now is around 50. I'll make 50 grand. And yes, I could probably make 75 or 80 on the open market, but I'll make my, I'll make my 50 this year. I'll make 52 next year. And then somewhere down the road, I'll get a master's. And by the end of my career, I'll be making, you know, the people at the top of the chart are making a hundred, 110, Trying whatever, like 95 but 95 to 105, I think. Yeah. But then when I retire, I'll be getting three quarters of that for the rest of my life. Right. And so and I've deferred my, my payments up front to the back end. So the people who really 
you know, the people who go into the profession for a couple of years and then leave, they're in some ways, you know, um, missing out on that long-term benefit uh, that right. the the people who stay in the career do uh, receive eventually. But the tenure thing, I think that's where um, it becomes a lot stickier because, you know, it's sort of like you can you can put on a a show for you know especially when you know that there's observations coming and scheduled and all that exactly. like like in fact, easy I've, to play I've, pretend for that short amount of time yeah and I, i've i've been on the other side where i've been the evaluator going into classrooms and like there's like this ri- ridiculous you know circus almost going on of like here let me show you all the wonderful things we're doing and mm-hmm. and it's like okay i know this isn't every day because i know I've seen what goes on. I've walked past your room other days. Like I know this isn't what usually happens here. So, um, and I think in in too many places where once you get hired, if you can, if you put in your three years and you know keep your head down and don't get you know in trouble in any way, you kind of we we had one one guy I worked with who just struggled to show up on time. Like my gosh, like it's the basic thing just show up on time and you're probably going to get tenure but if you don't show up you know you're going to get yourself in trouble um right but uh now there is a way to if somebody does get tenure they can theoretically lose tenure um if they have an, a certain number of consecutive um very very poor evaluations Really, but okay. it's it's really hard. I feel like to it's do. gonna be hard to get to that point because it is. You can play because, that act again when you know that evaluation is coming. And if you have even one satisfactory, it then resets it. Resets. Yeah. So it's like if it, I think it's something like you have to have. Uh, I don't don't quote me on this because I'm not a hundred percent sure, but it's it's something like three consecutive onset. Um, like one one puts you on probation, then the second one is like, you know, this is really bad, or or, or two years in a row, or something like that, everyone, whatever it is. Be careful, but, John. We already got in trouble with YouTube once today. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't I don't think uh, that's going to get I'm us in, into I, into YouTube jail. But I um, hope not. In any case, it, there is right. there is a way that you can uh, get can them. can have tenure revoked, but it's really hard and. I think it still is extraordinarily rare. Um, so I'm sure. I think yes. I, so to answer your question, Andrew, I think that is um, a bigger hurdle. You look at 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 schools. You know, it's in the best interest of schools to have stability in their workforces. You look at te- at charter schools that don't have tenure, and by and large, once teachers are there for three years they don't get fired. Like it just doesn't happen. Like if, if you've proved yourself, like usually we're in the charter schools, if you're not doing your job, you're going to be out very quickly. If you're there for three or four years and and you've proved that you know what you're doing, like they're going to try to keep you as long as they possibly can because turnover tends to be relatively high in the field. So, um, in some ways, I think that that tenure is solving an, an imagined problem. Um, that there's this notion that if if there wasn't tenure, well, then they just fire us left and right. And that's you know, you look in the rest of the world, the rest of private industry, you don't you just don't fire people, you know, left and right if they're doing a good yeah. job. Um, so, and that's the thing: if you do a good job, like, what? Well, why is there a worry about potentially being yeah, terminated? And you're even existing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that in the net world of like a pension um, qualification thing, that becomes a little, I think there's a little bit of a fear that somebody who starts off on a bachelor's degree is a, is a cheap hire, then they get, you know, they they work their way up, they, they amass a couple other degrees, they move up to the top of the guide. Now they're a lot more expensive that a school district that was looking to cut costs could say, well, let's get rid of these really expensive teachers and go bring in some fresh out of college kids. And I suppose there could be some really short sighted districts and administrators out there that might do something like that. Um, So I'm not going to completely discount that notion, but I mean, any administrator that has any 
you know, credibility in the world is going to say, Hey, if this teacher is actually good, right. you know, it's worth it to pay, pay that person what they're worth rather than hire somebody off the street who may be gone after two months. And then I've got to kind of have a revolving door right. of, and, and kids aren't learning anything. So, um, and again, I think that the, the, the school systems that are, the, the smaller and more personal you can get, the less likely you would have that sort of, you know, blind budget conscious, you know, cutting, I agree. you know, yeah. you could you'd say, I Hey, agree. look, you know, I, I know Mrs. So-and-so is a great teacher and, you know, we're, we're going to keep her as long as she can. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Th- Andrew, you killed it. One last question. And really, lastly, all I wanted to touch on was I know you made a really good point offhand, uh, off, off the air about um, the tenure situation, and I thought it was a good point to be made because um, I think the way that we were talking about it with uh, Andrew on the podcast was heavily angled from the um, outside looking in on teachers. Uh, I don't think it really gave a gave a perspective of what the system is like, and it's kind of what our whole show was about was the systems. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so would you mind uh, bringing it down a little bit for myself and the viewers about what it's like in that, uh, I guess in those trenches as it's, as a teacher, once you're actually in there three, four or five years. Yeah. Um, no, I think it's a, it's a really important point. Maybe something that we missed earlier was the, the, the fact that, um, the, the tenure system and the pension system and all the, these systems that exist in education, they exist. They exist and have existed long before any of us got here. Um, and so mm-hmm. it, as a new teacher entering the system, you know, you become part of that. That's that's the those are the rules that you're playing by. And so I think that anybody who wants to, you know, who, even if you don't like tenure, you don't like the system, you don't like the fact that, um, you know, there's a huge amount of money uh, that goes into the pension system, all that. Like it, the the proper course of action is not to blame teachers because teachers you don't have any say. That's the system that you're you're joining, um, right? You know, it's it's the nature of the profession, and and that's part of the deal that you're agreeing to at the time. Like if you're, you know, we talked about some of these folks that are are changing careers from private industry to uh, getting into education, becoming teachers. You know, yep. in a in a field like a chemistry, well, you can make more money as a chemist. In Just a lot of other in fields, pharmaceuticals or yeah, or working yeah, for you, big oil. Yep. Sure. Then then you can as as a high school teacher. So you're making that decision. Like, look, I'm going to go and be a teacher. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make less money up front. That's kind of the nature of the game because I'm on a salary chart, and this is where the only amount I'm going to make now. But there are other benefits. There's typically good medical. There's you know you know what the the contract hours are. You've got this pension system, you know, there is certain job security and inherent in, ten- in tenure if you can get it. So all of these things are part of that. And that's in many ways, it's part of compensation that teachers get. Like, yes, you don't get compensated as much up front, but maybe you do better on the pension end in the back end. Maybe you don't right. um, have the, uh, you know, the kind of perks that you might get, uh, you know, teacher appreciation <laughs> I believe today is Teacher Appreciation Day or, or week or whatever, which is kind of funny because you know mm-hmm. Teacher Appreciation Week often involves like you know cookies in the break room or something, which is right. very nice. But it's, I was going to say, you know, I was going to say you, the pizza pizza <laughs> instead of the raise, right? You see all the yeah, <laughs> and, and when you see like you know, I, I had a a colleague um, at the Department of Education whose uh, son was a uh, he he worked for Stryker um, as mm-hmm. a sales something or another um you know he was very very good at what he did and all but like and he would you know often get their top salesperson and whatever and like he's getting you know trips to the islands and you know right. fancy you know cruises and all this other kind of stuff and it's like yeah we get pizza and cookies in the break room yep. but um so you're there are certain things that you're giving up but there's also certain things that you're getting there's a job security that you know, if you have tenure and you're it's doing unrivaled. your job, you know, you're going to continue to have a job as opposed right. to, you know, if one year, you know, no matter how much they want to send you to the islands and, you know, make a big deal out of you, if all of a sudden you're, you know, 
you kind of stop producing and you know your sales go way down, you might be out of a job. Um, Correct. So there's a certain right. you know security that goes with it. So ultimately, like you know, you can critique the system and and even work to change the system, but the the appropriate thing to do is not to to point fingers and blame anybody yeah. who's part of the system because that's it's the system I mean, just like we're all bought into the system you know nationally of things like social security and medicare and, right. and all that we may not love the systems we may think that they were poorly conceived when they were founded or they haven't been updated sufficiently i mean the if you look at the life expectancy today versus what it was in the 30s when social security came in i mean it's it's got a totally different meaning now than it did back then right. um right. And we can critique that all we want, but the folks who are retired now, who paid in, you know, their mm-hmm. whole careers and who expected to get this benefit, you know, you, you can't sit there and blame the seniors for saying, well, you greedy seniors, you're getting taking all this money. Right. Well, that's, that's what they were, you know, that's the deal. I was what right. they were promised. So I think that any solutions have to, you know, be more, um, you know, forward looking and saying, okay, well, from now on, here's what we're going to do. And then also, um, you know, think about how do we, you know, keep the promises we've made to people along the way, maybe making the systems better than, than they are now. Um, sure. But, but it's very, very difficult. And that's why I think you're, you're seeing in many places, it's easier to do disruptive change than it is to do incremental change. It's easier. Um, it's easier to bite the bullet. It's, it's easier, when, especially when it's gone down a road so far. It's, it's yes, easier and to bite I think, the bullet. Well, an in incremental change, like for example, change within the system, is mm-hmm. it's tough because you know you're going to have folks who are. I mean, every, gonna every point is going to be well. Every point is going to be contested, and you have to say, right. okay, well, I'm going to give you this, and we give you that, and it becomes like this give and take. Give and and take so when time, when a yeah. system is really you know not working properly, what you see is you see you know outside solutions. You see things like virtual mm-hmm. schools. You see charters mm-hmm. coming in uh, where you're. People can come in and start from a clean slate and say, "Hey, we're going to do something differently here." Right, and it's um, you know, but it's, it's interesting. Um, but there's, uh, I think that uh, it, the, the challenge for us is to not break the system any worse than it has been. And I, I think that there's been times when that has occurred, um, mm. and that's those are really unfortunate points in our history because you can point, look back and say, you know, we had something better and it, um, it's, you know, it's because of this some, point, because of decisions that were made, we, we've really, uh, we dropped the ball on something. And, right. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would, I would love just to close it on this point then if with all that being said, um, you know, we highlighted quite a few issues that were way beyond just uh, tenure or, pension or anything else in one specific iota um would there be like i don't know two three four things that you would just hope get implemented soon or get talked about that you see just yourself um that are just obvious i would say um for one thing it's been this is specifically on education for everybody. Of course, by the yeah. way. I'm sorry for uh, sorry for being so vague. <laughs> you know, I think we've had a. Um, it, it's been very difficult to start getting into a system where performance is evaluated by metrics, and it, oh, okay. it's kind of there's been a right. there's a whole bunch of like teaching to the test is one concept that that and, and like those are not healthy things. I mean. In some in some respects, um, you've had these debates uh, that are we're still using arguments of based on on what was going on ten fifteen years ago, and uh, okay. technology has evolved, testing has evolved, data has evolved, and yet we're still making the same exact arguments that we did at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. When they first came out and they said, all right, we're going to say we're going to evaluate teachers based on the performance of students. The tests were not always the most um, informative. They could tell you, yes, this student did better than that student. 
but we didn't necessarily have a, like a growth trajectory. Tests from one grade level to the next weren't necessarily aligned. You'd have, in gotcha. fact, it was it was well known in certain states that like the seventh grade test was really hard, and then the eighth grade test was really easy, and so you know you'd have these wildly varying uh, passage year by year and answers like, and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, okay. yeah. The technology has gotten a lot better. Um, the the leveling has gotten a lot better. I think that we we have a much better concept, and we have data warehouses of longitudinal growth that are tied to unique student identifiers. So we can punch in your student number and we can see where you were every single year. We mm -hmm. can see years that maybe you made more growth, years that you made less growth. And when, and yes, maybe one student had a, a bad year at home or whatever and didn't make as much growth, but then another student probably had a good year and there was, a, you know, you're going to see um, data that's going to suggest where teacher effectiveness comes in. And I think that overall patterns, maybe you're looking at over eight years or five years. Right. 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 And when you have longitudinal data on students and you can sit there and, and also norm that against a much, much bigger sample size where you have students over an entire district or state taking the same exam um, by the same teacher the, or teachers. Yeah. It's, right. it's not, not just like the, like in the when if they first came out, it was like how many students of yours passed. Well, if all of your students were coming in way below proficient, you might be the greatest teacher in the world, and you might not have that many students actually quote unquote pass. Makes sense. But right now we have the data to show what growth uh, metrics are, uh, are are coming into play, and that's where we can really look at, at how effective a teacher was if, if a teacher gotcha. is able to grow students more than the average teacher would more than than most teachers would gotcha. and and there are places in, in the country that are, are doing this much better um right now it's primarily ela and math but i think we can we can look at other uh, fields to figure out how to assess some of these things better i think there's also a teacher practice component that could come into this but i think that sure. for a long time education has been opposed to looking at any sort of outcomes as a worthy method of evaluating teachers and right that's you know it's just in it is part of a, a a system that is based on the sort of um, plug and play mentality that that sure. one one certified English teacher is you know can be substituted for another certified English teacher at any point, and that we just we all know that that's not true. We had wonderful teacher, you know, we had some everyone's good had a good one, had some average teachers, we had mm -hmm. yeah, and and I think that we need to do more to recognize those teachers that really do make uh, a significant I difference. And, I agree. Um, and also therefore, I think that's where you could actually see some movement in the way the system works is that if we could then compensate people who Based really are right. exceptional, because the solution has always been, if a teacher is really good, what do you do? You promote them and you make them a, a vice principal. So then or he's no but, longer a teacher. He's no longer doing the thing he's good at. Right. right because you know, this teacher, you know, he or she might have been a wonderful, you know, English teacher, but but may not want to have anything to do with like discipline or whatever a vice principal right. does on a daily basis. Yeah, you know, that teacher might just really want to teach English, and so there's got to be some type of uh, recognition and um, or career yeah. ladder aspect. There should be nothing wrong with having a high paid, high performing teacher if they do a good job and they earn their money. I don't see anything wrong with that. Yeah. And the other thing I think is um, when you look at, at systems, like the the systems that are really struggling. I mean, mm. here in New Jersey, we, I mentioned earlier, we had like 600 and something, 601 independent school districts. And, yeah. and you know, uh, probably half of them do really good work on an average basis. And, you know, some could probably be a little better, but um, we know that there are some systems that really struggle. And I think that it should not be the role of governments or or any other organizations to get in the way of um, any progress that might improve the opportunities available to students. So you look at some okay. cities that have done a lot of work um, encouraging like innovation zones, uh, mm -hmm. having charters, having nonprofits that come in to support education. You know, 
there there has to be a better way forward. I mean, it's not. I, okay. I don't think anybody is saying we need to completely, you know, we don't want to necessarily privatize all of education or get rid of public schools or get rid of teachers or get rid. Of, I mean, there's there has to be some. Um, you know, I'm not a. I happen to. I taught in a public school. I went to a public school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've. I'm also on the board of a charter school. I've been, you know, involved in some Catholic schools. I, I don't consider myself to be an evangelist for, you know, any particular school configuration. Um, I think that we need great public schools. Um, right. Charter schools are public schools um, in almost every instance and in every, every, almost every state. Um, and so, you know, I think we we do need to have that option um, as part of, you know, a, a promoting a sort of democratic equality um, in the country is we don't have if yeah, our sure. public schools can't compete with private schools, well, then we're, we're really not living up to uh, what our, you know, our, really all of our national history is about. Sure. Um, Absolutely. But we can't be tied to one type of school, you know, organizational yeah, structure. To be made too. Um, yeah. Like if we have a lousy charter school, it should close. If we have a, a lousy Catholic school, it should close. It should if close, we have yeah. a lousy public school, it should close. Also close. Um, yeah. Or, you know, or get help or get, you know, reconfigured or, you know, something yeah, has to change because we shouldn't have shouldn't lousy just get schools. Neglected. Yeah, it shouldn't just get neglected because, oh, yeah. well, they don't have that many students. So it's really not affecting that many families. Right. Nor is the solution just like, well, we're going to get rid of all the public schools and make them all charters because I've seen some really lousy charter schools too. I mean, there there are some that are wonderful. when they have the monopoly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are some that are wonderful, but there are also some that are really terrible. And, um, right. You know, it's just because something is a charter doesn't make it great. Just because something is a public school doesn't make it great or bad or whatever. Um, and I think we need to kind of, when it gets into the world of politics, we tend to get, a lot of these absolutes where people are arguing, especially for, now. Yeah. Yeah. A, a particular school type. Um, I think that, that the choice is really important. I believe that, that, that having uh, a marketplace is really important and there are relatively few places in the country where we really do have a true marketplace. Um, right. There's factors like transportation and geography and access that, that all sort of play into it. So um I mean, I probably could count on, you know, two hands the the number of of cities that are really promising in terms of the amount of um, a marketplace that actually exists. But, um, mm. but I think that may be something that we could see down the road. So I think, Definitely. you know, when you're talking about solving problems and what are some of the drivers of it, um, you know, being able to um, re- retain and attract high quality teachers um, to the field. And some of that has to be changing the way that, that teachers are recognized and compensated. And then also the, the school configurations and figuring out how do we, right. how do we ensure higher quality schools as a whole. Um, and that's people kind of sometimes being a little bit um, less tied to their particular, you know, fiefdoms and saying, look, sure. you know what, there's a there's a Catholic school doing wonderful things, or there's a public a charter school doing wonderful things, or a public school doing wonderful things. What are they doing? How do we do? How do we try to be more like that? Um, yeah. And yeah, or get them more funding and more kids in the door because they're doing something right. Yeah, and and I think when you look at at how um, some of some cities have tackled this, um, there's been cities that have actually done studies of like where are our high quality seats like how many schools do we have in in this part of the city that have really high quality education options and then right. if they say okay well we got the the north side is really well covered but the south side isn't we need to really incentivize you know you know either new new operators to come in into the south side or we need to inject um you know some uh, maybe take one of our public schools and turn it into some sort of innovation school, pay some t- pay teachers an incentive to go to that school, find ways to improve the quality of that particular school. Correct. Um, right. And there's, it, it can be done. I think that there are things that there are tools that are available to system level leaders and um, we need to be 
a little bit more willing to use those tools. Yeah, just open to it. Well, John, I want to thank you. I know we ran definitely longer than either you or I were, <laughs> were expecting to, but uh, love the conversation. I'll get to putting this together, probably have it out next week. But uh, this was just fantastic. And I think we really covered some bases that were, um, I know in my head were too, we're kind of scratching at it. Like, I feel like we could have talked even a little deeper. Um, so I, I just can't thank you enough for coming on. And uh, like I said, we'll try to arrange Father Ed soon. So my pleasure. Well, it's been, been great talking to you, Sal. Oh, thank you, John. And uh, everybody else, go check us out. Uh, new website's out. So if you haven't, go take a look at it for now. These bitches say, damn, I wish I were the fucking state. I want to be something, not nothing. Trapped inside my dream and I'm running, running away from these demons. But the feeling's so good, I'm going to keep dreaming.